Good evening and welcome to Big Questions Harrodsburg. We're here for night three. We've had two excellent evenings and we're looking forward to a great night tonight as well. We'd like to welcome you uh, who are here in the live audience and also those of you who are, who are streaming with us on Periscope. Uh, last night we had 116 viewers in our prayers that that number continues to grow tonight and tomorrow night as well. We want your feedback and we want your questions. We all have questions in life. And this week is based around the idea of if you could ask God one question, what would it be? Tonight we're going to seek to address the topic of what is heaven? What does the Bible say about heaven? We all long for it and we can't wait to see that day. But what will, true, what will heaven truly be like? Again, this is not about what we think. This is not about our opinion. We are simply seeking to go to the word of God to see what God has told us on this matter. Tonight, Brother Philip Jenkins is going to be bringing us the message. Philip grew up in the Nashville, Tennessee area. He graduated from Freed Hardeman University where he met Laura Manning. Uh, they are married with two children, Lucas and Holly. And he's been the youth minister at Mount Juliet for six years. And so tonight, Philip will be talking to us on the topic of what will heaven be like. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. It is good to be with you guys tonight. Hope everybody's had a good day. Uh, I have been uh, the last couple of nights uh, across town and uh, at the uh, Lawrenceburg uh, Church of Christ and excited to be here with you guys this evening at the Mercer Church of Christ. We welcome everybody who's watching online and uh, we really hope that you'll think about stopping by here. We have one more night of the live event. It's uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock here at the Mercer Church of Christ in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. And uh, we really, really would love to have you here, and I hope we get the chance to meet you. Welcome to everybody who's here with us in the audience, uh, streaming live and also here in the auditorium. We're glad you're here. I know there's some guests uh, who've made their way here tonight. We thank you so much uh, for coming tonight. Maybe you're here because uh, you have questions. Uh, maybe you're here because you're, you're curious about the Word of God. Whatever it is that brings you here, we're glad uh, that you're joining us this evening. Tonight, questions about heaven. What will heaven be like? Man, this is a tough one, right? How do you prepare to talk about a place that you've never been? Someone's like, hey, are you ready for tonight? I'm as ready as I can be to talk about a place that I've never been to. So I'm excited about the subject, uh, but the good news is I know the one who came from heaven. I know the one who's from there, and uh, he tells us a lot about that place. But before we get there, I want to kind of start light. Let's start light and we'll go deep. Um, what are some of your favorite things in life? Like, what are some of your favorite things in this world? We'll see if this clicker works. Uh, you gotta love bacon. That's gotta be on your list, right? <laughs> Especially like bacon uh, wrapped kittens. I think they serve those at some Chinese restaurants. Um, <laughs> I love, uh, how about the beach? You gotta love the beach. That's one of my favorite places. Uh, the ocean, uh, sleep, sleep is pretty good especially the sleeping cute animals. Uh, you gotta love those. Uh, how about roller coasters? Those are great. Not that one, but most of them. Um, how about uh, vacations, uh, summertime, music, falling in love, babies, like especially ones with facial hair, uh, children, those are my kids on the screen, uh, hanging out with your friends, uh, probably Pokemon Go is probably on some of your list right now, favorite thing in life. Uh, some of you are like, where did you find those Pokemon? I need those for my collection. Um, sunsets, fishing, <laughs> uh, being outdoors, <coughs> sightseeing, food in general. Snow, being with your family. Uh, how about this? You, I, bet, I bet in Kentucky you love this. A cloudless night out in the country where there's no lights around. Maybe that's one of your favorite places uh, to be out there under the stars. Uh, and you gotta love college football, right? Do you love college football in Kentucky like we do in Tennessee? I think it, we're in the South, so probably so. When's the last time you stopped to admire something beautiful about the world that we live in? When's the last time you did that? 
Louis Armstrong stopped to do that. You remember the song, right? He said it this way, I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They le learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Right? <laughs> Psalm 19, verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We really do live in a beautiful world. God's given us a beautiful place to enjoy. But as great as this place is, we're only here for a little while. And as wonderful as this place is, there, there are a whole lot of things about it that, that aren't so wonderful. I mean, have you, have you watched the news lately? Um, racism, killing, hatred, injustice, death, there's infidelity that rips families apart, there's greed, there's apathy, there's people being mistreated, there's favoritism, bullying, terrorism, suicide bombings, poverty, oppression, addiction, liars, hypocrites, neglect, gossip, stealing, abuse of all kinds, and the list goes on and on and on, and we can get more and more depressed the more that we talk. I guess Louis Armstrong uh, must have been a glass half full kind of guy, uh, because I hear that kind of stuff, and it makes me want to write another song uh, called What a Miserable World. Um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that God's given us this world. I really am, but I'm even more thankful that this world is not my home. I'm even more thankful that there's something more. I'm thankful that this world isn't all there is. I'm thankful there's a heaven. <coughs> Philippians 3 verse 20 is one of my favorite verses in all of God's word. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This world is not my home, heaven is. Don't you love to sing songs about heaven? We sang a song just a minute ago uh, about heaven. Sing to me of heaven. There's so many um, passages in God's word that paint beautiful images of what heaven's going to be like. And as we study tonight, you'll probably have some of those songs ringing in your ears if you know some songs like that. Uh, where we see uh, the ideas and the concepts that come straight out of scripture. Uh, we sing songs like, this world is not my home. How beautiful heaven must be. I've heard of a land, uh, to Canaan's land, I'm on my way, and on and on and on. I'll fly away. A lot of songs you probably know. So what's heaven going to be like? In a way, uh, that's, that's like us trying to describe, uh, in a way, us trying to describe the afterlife is, is like two unborn babies discussing what life must be like outside the womb. Like, they can't do that. They don't have the words. That it would just kind of blow their minds. Thankfully, God sheds some light on that. And he gives us some details. One of the big resources that God gives us on the topic of heaven is, is uh, the entire book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is, is so cool. And the way that God went about writing this book and giving us this book is unlike any other book that we really read in God's word. It's got such a cool like backstory and the story that we get it. Uh, of how we got it, the, the way we got it is pretty cool in and of itself. He allowed John, one of Jesus' apostles, uh, to glimpse inside some of the scenes of heaven and see some things that nobody else has ever seen before. And, uh, and th these things that John got to see were absolutely amazing. And it, it seems that John, it seems as if John had a hard time putting the things that he was seeing into words. Have you ever been there before? You had a hard time like explaining something? Uh, that's why we see him in, in the book of Revelation, I think, why we see him using so many comparisons. He says, I saw something like this, and I saw something like that. It's because he had such a hard time comparing it into anything that we had here. Uh, remember the analogy I made just a second ago about babies describing life outside the womb? Um, imagine 
that you're the one trying to describe life to that baby inside the womb. I mean, how do you do that? How do you describe waterfalls and milkshakes and bacon double cheeseburgers uh, to, to this baby that's still inside the womb? That's, that's similar, perhaps that's similar to the challenge that John had when he was describing these otherworldly scenes. These things that, I mean, how do, you, how do you describe the scenes of heaven with our limited vocabulary that we have down here on earth? How do you describe otherworldly scenes without having an entire new list of vocabulary words? And uh, that it was probably very hard for him. So what's heaven going to be like? Here's what God's word tells us. There's five things I want us to notice tonight. Uh, the number one sounds very basic, but I think it's an important uh, point to notice. Number one. Heaven is a place. Heaven is a place. You're probably thinking, okay, you're not going to blow my mind tonight. Well, stay with me. Heaven is a place. It's not this um, state of mind. It's not this um, altered state of reality. It's not this dream sequence or this vague idea. Heaven is a place. Well, how do I know that? Because God tells us in his word. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, Paul wrote, We have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Hebrews 11 verse 10 tells us that heaven is a city with foundations whose designer and builder is God. Those songs ringing through your head yet? There's a holy and beautiful city. Uh, and how about um, a city with foundations firm as the eternal throne? I love John 14 verses 1 through 4 where Jesus says this. We'll come back to this passage later tonight. I love this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Heaven is a place built by God and prepared by Jesus. But it's not just a place. It's also important to know that number two, heaven is a better place. Heaven's a better place. In Hebrews 11, verse 16, we read this. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. The Bible says it's going to be a better place. And when God says something is going to be better, we better believe that, right? We get excited when, when Apple, the builder of the iPhone, we get excited when Apple says, hey, guess what? We've built a better iPhone. And like people stand in line for hours to be the first ones to get this brand new iPhone. And when God, the one who built this world says, hey, I built you a better one. We ought to get excited about that. We ought to trust him. Uh, God always keeps his promises. Paul believed that. In Philippians 1, verses 21 through 23, Paul wrote, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. Look at verse 23. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He said, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Well, why? Because being with Christ is... Is going to be so much better than anything this world has to offer down here on earth. Yeah. Why else would heaven be better? Well, it'll be better also because of what's not there. It'll be better also because of what's not there. I uh, remember my hit song to Louis Armstrong's release. There's going to be a lot of things in heaven that we're going to have to worry about, like we have to worry about here on earth. Uh, one of my favorite verses in all of God's word is Revelation 21 verse 4. I just think these words are so beautiful. Maybe you can connect with this because maybe you've had a life that's been full of a lot of sadness and sorrow and loss and despair. Um, there's plenty There's plenty to be upset about here on earth. But I love this. Revelation 21 verse 4. How beautiful is this? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Can't help but think about the song, No Tears in Heaven. Maybe you've had a life uh, where that passage could bring tears to your eyes. Because the thought of going to a place 
where you're not going to have to experience loss anymore. It just brings you a lot of joy. A place untouched by sin. Heaven's going to be awesome because it's a place untouched by death. Have you thought about it this way before? Heaven, in some ways, is going to be a lot like the Garden of Eden. It's, it's kind of cool to think about it this way because all the way back in the beginning, all the way back at the beginning of the Bible and all the way back at the beginning of time, um, we saw a time where God and man were together in the same place, where God and man were able to be in communion and fellowship with one another. Remember Adam and Eve back before sin had kind of ruined the picture? They're in the Garden of Eden and the Bible tells us they're able to hear uh, the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the midst of the cool of the day. And, uh, and, and Adam and Eve, apparently there was a time, we don't know how long the time lasted, but there was a time where God and man were together like that. And then sin enters the picture and it messes it all up. I like pictures. The pictures help you. I like things to be simple. Um, but at one time, this is what the picture looked like. God and man were together and there was nothing to mess it up. And everything was good and everything was happy. And that's the beginning of God's word. Uh, right before sin enters the picture. So that's what it looked like before. But you know the rest of the story probably. Sin enters the picture. Adam and Eve take of the forbidden fruit. They eat the tree of the knowledge. They eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they had to be punished. They had to be kicked out of Eden. And so that relationship between God and man was different. And now the picture looks different. Now God and man are separated by sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2 teaches us that our iniquities or our sins, it's another word for sins, our iniquities have made a separation between us and God. And so that's what happened there in the Garden of Eden when man chose sin. Now there's the separation between God and man. Well, it's kind of interesting to think about. All the way back at the beginning of the Bible, God and man are together. Sin enters the picture and the rest of the scriptures, the entire rest of the Bible, the rest of the story is really about how do we get back to picture number one? How do we get back to when things look like this? Well, it's pretty awesome the way that God takes care of us. And it's pretty cool the way he puts his plan into motion. Um, I'll get back to that in just a minute. But when sin enters the picture, you know what else enters the picture? Death. Until sin comes into the Bible, we never read about death. Like death apparently was not a part of the plan until sin comes into the picture. And so we never read about death in the Word of God until we read about sin. As James would teach us in James 1.15, sin brings death. And as we read also in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. What does that mean? Well, the price of a sin is death. Death carries, or sin carries the, the death penalty. When we commit a sin, that, that's the price for what we're owed. And it's more bad news because Romans 3.23 says all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So that's not a good picture. Again, okay, let's kind of back up. Why are we talking about this? I thought we are talking about heaven. Stay with me. Heaven is a place with no sin. Since heaven is a place with no sin, heaven is also a place where there is no what? Death. It's called a place of life. A place of eternal life. And since there's no more sin, what's our relationship with God look like once more? What it should have looked like and what it used to look like in the very beginning. Now we're with God again and in heaven we'll be with him and there'll be fellowship with him. and We'll have this relationship with God and we'll be able to see him as we've never seen him before. And so what is heaven? Well, it's a place that's a little bit like Eden, a little bit like it was all the way back at the beginning of time because that's when God and man had a relationship that was untouched by sin. That's heaven. That's awesome. A place where God and man can be together again without sin to get in our way and mess it up. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 51 through 56. Paul is writing here about what's going to happen after we die. And he gets really excited as he's writing. You can almost kind of feel the excitement uh, that death has no power in the place to where we're going. And he continues, and, and he gets more excited because um, he, he uses the word victory. And, and he gets more excited as he thinks about the one who overcame death. And remember the picture of sin separating us from God? He gets excited as he thinks about the one who took sin away and the one who paid the price tag for sin. Remember, the wages of sin is death. He gets excited as he talks about Christ who gave us the victory. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 56. 
He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but all, we all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? In heaven, there is no more death. We can't feel the sting of, of sin. Verse 56, the sting of sin, the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is really cool too. As you keep thinking a little bit more about Eden and, and heaven and maybe some of the comparisons there. Uh, there's another scene that's described in heaven that it reaches all the way back uh, to the book of Genesis. All the way back to Eden. When you think about the trees uh, that were in the Garden of Eden. I, I don't know like what comes to your mind immediately. But probably most of us, we think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like the, the infamous tree that kind of messed everything up. The one that Adam and Eve uh, were so fixated on. And um, everybody maybe thinks about that one. It was right there in the middle of the Garden of Eden. But there's another tree that the Bible mentions that was also right there in the middle of the Garden of Eden. And apparently, Adam and Eve didn't think about that one a whole lot either. Because we never see them take that tree into consideration. Um, even though, again, it was right there in the middle. So all the way back in Genesis, we read about this mysterious tree that we really don't know that much about. Except that when Adam and Eve got kicked out of Eden, God wanted to make sure that they didn't have a way to get back to that tree again. In Genesis 3, 22 through 24, we read this. Here's the punishment that God hands down. He's talking about the tree and what's going to happen. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden... Placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Yikes. Don't go back to Eden. You don't want to cross that guy. But the tree of life vanishes. And we never really see or hear anything about this tree again. Until you get to the very last chapter of God's word. Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2. This is so cool. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on the other, on either side of the river, what do you see? The tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. You know what tree we don't read about in heaven? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why is that? Sin can't mess it up anymore. Sin's not an option. We don't have the ability to mess it up. We won't be able to choose sin because heaven is a better place. A place that sin cannot touch. Sorry I preached a lot there. I just got excited about heaven. Let's move on. Okay, the next thing, number three. Uh, heaven is eternal. Heaven is eternal. Sometimes there's debate, like religious debate about whether or not heaven and hell will be eternal. To be honest with you, I don't know why. I don't know why there's any debate about this uh, because I don't know how much clearer Jesus could say it. I mean, what would Jesus have to say about heaven in order to indicate that it, that it was an eternal place? Or what would Jesus have to say in order to indicate that hell was an eternal place? I don't know, maybe something like, Heaven is eternal, <laughs> or hell is eternal. How about that idea? Here's the end of the passage in Matthew 25. Um, I don't know how more clearly he could put it. Uh, verse 41, 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, do you remember this passage about the least of these? He says, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? 
Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Bible says that our resurrection bodies will be imperishable. We just read that a minute ago in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It also says we'll receive an imperishable inheritance, 1 Peter 1, verse 4. That we'll receive an imperishable crown, that's 1 Corinthians 9, 25. That word imperishable means not liable to corruption or decay. It means it's going to last forever. How about this? Maybe you've asked this before. What will we do there? What will we do in heaven? You ever wondered that? I've wondered that before. What, what are we going to spend? We're going to have all this time, infinite time, eternity. What are we going to spend our time doing? Here's a few things that God's Word tells us. <laughs> We're not given a, an itinerary like on Tuesdays at 9 a.m., tent making with Paul. Or, you know, Wednesdays at, at 7 a.m., fishing with Peter. Maybe we get to do those things. I don't know. But we're not told exactly. What are, what are we told? Well, we're told a few things. Number one, uh, we're told that we will enjoy the fellowship of the saints. In other words, a simple way of saying it, we'll be with God's people forever. That's pretty awesome. Those who came and lived their word, who live out the word of God, those who follow God all their life, won't it be awesome to be with the people of God? The greatest people that have ever lived all together in one place. Man, that's awesome. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I love the last part of this verse. And so we will always be with the Lord. That is a beautiful verse. What else will we do in heaven? Well, we know that we will worship the Lord. We know that we will worship the Lord. Revelation 7 verse 9 says this. After this I looked. And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's another song that we sing. What else will we do in heaven? Well, we know that we'll, we know that we'll serve God. We see that in Revelation 7.15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. What else will we do in heaven? Well, we know that we'll be busy. We'll be doing things like serving. But we also know that heaven will be a land of rest. Remember that song? On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast forth a wishful eye. Get to the chorus. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by. Hebrews 4 verses 8 through 11. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken about another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Some people have this idea uh, that heaven's going to be this really boring place. Where uh, we kind of like twiddle our thumbs and sit on clouds and play harps and float around with wings. Um, but it's got to be so much more than that. Um, Kenny Chesney came out with a song a few years ago. Don't you love Kenny Chesney? Uh, the message of the song. Uh, remember the song that he came out with that was Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven, But Nobody Wants to Go Now. And um, kind of the, the message of the song is, yeah... Heaven can wait, because it sounds kind of lame. I kind of hate that song, um, because I'm telling you, if God wants to take us to heaven, and he does, if God wants to take us to heaven, we should want to go. And we should want to go there as soon as possible. I mean, don't you think the one who invented the earth, this place that, that we sort of love at times, the, the one who invented the earth, a place that we love so much, a place with everything, uh, that the one who created everything on this earth and everything in this earth, uh, don't you think that guy couldn't invent a place worth going to? Don't you think that, I mean, think about it, like all your favorite things in life, uh, tropical paradise is your, your favorite sport, um, your favorite video game, your favorite movie, Walt Disney World, you realize God invented inventors. 
So don't you think God is capable of giving us a place that will offer us so much more than what we see here? Number four, it's, it's sad, but it's true because Jesus said it. Heaven is not for everyone. Heaven is not for everybody. That's the bad news, but it's the truth. And Jesus makes it very clear that not everybody's going to enter the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In the very same chapter, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Jesus put it pretty clearly. There's not a lot of people that are going to go to heaven. And most people are not. Guys, I think, I think we've got to be careful about giving people false hope. At the end of this life, not everybody gets to go to heaven. And to say otherwise would be to teach something that Jesus did not teach. Jesus did not hold back when it came to talking about hell. Number five, uh, the fifth thing about heaven. Heaven is for those who follow Christ faithfully. Heaven is for those who follow Christ faithfully. Back in John 14, 5 and 6, where we read Jesus talking to his apostles. He says, hey, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and where I am you may be also. And he says, don't worry, you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas sort of interrupts him. And he says uh, in verse 5, go to the next slide. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you want to go to heaven? I hope so. Jesus says, if you want to go to heaven, you need me. He's the only one who can take us where the Father is. Why do you want to go to heaven? What are you looking forward to? Like, you ever thought about that? What are you looking forward to about heaven? Is it, is it the place... Is the scenery, like, do you want to see a, a street of gold? Maybe you do. I do. I want to see a street of gold. Maybe it's uh, the pearly gates. Maybe it's the, the tree of life, that mysterious tree. Maybe it's the, the sea of glass. And no doubt those things will all be nice to see. Is it the people? Is that why we want to go to heaven? To be with God's people? The idea of being together for all of eternity with those who love the Lord and live their lives for Him. Some of our heroes in the faith. Some of our loved ones. Maybe your grandparents who are faithful to God, won't that be awesome? I look forward to seeing my grandparents again, along with many others that have moved on. But there's something I want to see way more than any of those things. For me, it's not just about the place, and it's not just about the people. For me, it's that we'll finally be with the one who's only loved us from the very beginning. We've never met anybody like God before. We've had people that have loved us. We've had parents, probably, that loved us. Maybe you have parents that loved you. Maybe you've had a, a spouse. Maybe you have a spouse that loves you. Maybe a family that loves you. But we have never met anybody like God before because everything he's ever done has been right. He's never made a mistake. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Won't that be awesome? Our parents made mistakes. Our spouses make mistakes. Nobody said amen. That's probably good. Probably a wise move. Won't it be awesome to be in the presence of the one who has loved us from the very beginning? Everything he's ever done, every decision he's ever made, every plan he's put into motion is because he loves us. I'll close with this thought. A few uh, years ago, there was a book that came out uh, called Heaven is for Real. Y'all remember this? Uh, it it kind of like made headlines. I think it was on the New York Times bestseller list uh, because it told the story about this little boy who uh, supposedly died and he got to go and look at heaven and, and see 
what it was going to be like. And it's this book, and I think they made it into a movie, and it, it kind of made headlines for a while. I'm not dogging the boy. I'm not dogging the family. I'm not dogging you if you love the book or the movie. Okay, I'm not here to pick a fight with you about that. But isn't it interesting how Jesus, 2,000 years ago, could say heaven is for real? And apparently a little boy can say it and people start to believe it. When Jesus says something, we can trust him. And when Jesus comes down from heaven and says, hey, heaven's for real. It's where I'm from. If that's where you want to go, you follow me and I'll take you home. That's beautiful. We can always trust the one who built the way to heaven. Thank you. Question time. Everybody's favorite part where you guys get to drill me with questions and uh, and hopefully I can answer them. Okay. The part that you didn't get to prepare for I that know. you got to prepare for for the last 40 minutes. Yes. Okay, so the first question has to do along the lines. I can remember 10 years ago last Wednesday, my granddad, Papa Mac, passed away. And I was 11 years old and I didn't exactly understand what all was happening, but I remember that a lot of people that day said, Don't worry, you're going to see him again. And probably something we've all heard and something we may have even said, will we recognize each other in heaven? Yeah, I think about, um, remember the story of David and Bathsheba, and we remember the bad part of the story and, and um, how things really just went from bad to worse to worse to worse to worse. And I guess one of the lowest times is when um, the punishment is given to David and um, it's handed down from God that he has to lose a child. And so this, this baby that's born uh, to David and Bathsheba uh, dies. And the, the men that are with David uh, are really, they don't want to tell him. Uh, they don't want to talk to him about it because they, they're just afraid it's going to break him. And, uh, and David, in a, in a way, it seems like he found comfort in this statement. He said, I can't go to him. or I, I, He can't come back to me, but now I can go where he is. I can go back to him one day. And see him, and so we we find comfort in in things like people said to you about, hey, don't worry, one day you'll see your grandfather again, and um, and maybe that 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 is a really comforting thought, but is it taught in the scriptures? Um, look with me. I think it's Matthew chapter eight and verse eleven, and I want us to, to look at a passage from God's word that um, that I think helps shed a light. On this. I think it's Matthew 8 11. I hope it's Matthew 8 11. Yeah, that's a good thing. Otherwise, that would have been embarrassing. All right, Matthew 8 11, where Jesus says these words. He says, I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Interesting. So, what is Jesus telling us here? Well, He's telling it, he names some some kind of some key figures in God's word, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And those are some guys who've been dead for a long time, right? And he tells us that there's going to be a time in the kingdom of heaven where we can like recline and hang out with those guys. It's a loose translation, but we can hang out with those guys. And how are we going to hang out with them if we don't know who they are? And so that that gives me a little comfort. I, I tend to believe, yes, we will recognize one another in heaven. It seems like our identity, yes, our, our bodies will be changed, will look different in heaven. I don't know exactly what we'll look like, but we're told some things about how our, our perishable will become imperishable. So some things will be different. We don't know exactly what we're going to look like, but we do know that our identity will not change. Who we are in this life is who we'll be in the next life. Um, and apparently we will be able uh, to recognize one another in heaven according to that verse right there. We also see like on the mountain of transfiguration, when Elijah and uh, Moses appear there, they still are able to be recognized as Moses and Elijah. And so, you know, apparently, unless something really weird happened where Jesus brought them back and made them look like them again, um, 
But there's no reason to think that he would have done that. He just would have brought them back and they would have recognized them as Moses and Elijah. That, maybe that helps answer that question. Connected with that question, you referenced in the lesson that the sad reality is that a lot of people who are very religious may not wind up in heaven. And so connected with the last question, not only will we recognize each other, but will we recognize who is missing? Yeah, thanks for the easy question. Uh, will we? Okay, so the first one, will we recognize each other in heaven? The second one, will we recognize the people that aren't in heaven? Um, the people that maybe that we love that didn't make it, that didn't didn't find their way to heaven. Um, I guess the answer is I don't totally know, but here's what I do know. I know that if we're able to know who's missing, apparently God in a way that only God can do and a power that only he has and the wisdom that only he has, it will not, he will not allow us to be so overcome with grief that we'll be miserable because we're told was Revelation 21 verse 4, I believe. Where there, there will be a place where there is no more pain, no more crying, no more mourning. And so if we are able to recognize who's missing, uh, apparently God will make it God will make it in a way where we will be okay to survive and function and, uh, and still have great joy and not have any mourning or crying. That's a tough one, but, uh, but that's the best I can do, I think, from the scriptures. Thank you. Last one. This one has to do with 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, uh, which reads, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, to be kept until the judgment. And the question reads, Can I decide to rebel against God in a similar way to how Satan did when he was kicked out of heaven? We'll end on a good one. Okay. Thanks for the easy questions tonight. Uh, yeah, I... Um, I have a five-year-old little boy, and he's, he's really intrigued with heaven and asking questions. He loves to ask questions about uh, Satan and, and God, and, and he, he likes to say things like he, he, he wants to be affirmed, like, who, God, he's like, hey, Daddy, um, I love you, but do you know who I love the most? I'm like, who? God? It's his answer. Every, he, he loves to ask questions that he knows the answer to. But the other day he said something uh, to the effect of, hey, when we're in heaven, we always have to follow God, don't we? Because Satan chose to rebel against God and he got kicked out of heaven. So we don't ever want to do that, do we? And I was like, I don't know how to answer your question. <laughs> so here's what we do know. When God says it's going to be an eternal home, when Jesus tells us it's going to be a place where we get to spend eternity, we get to live with God, if we have the ability to make an eternal home a temporary home, then Jesus has not been able to keep his word. So I do not believe we'll be able to rebel against God in heaven because there will be no sin in heaven. There will be no temptations in heaven. Uh, we're told that it is a place uh, where there'll be no uncleanness. I think that's Revelation 22. Um, yeah, no undefiled thing can enter into that place. And so, um, yeah, and, and there's no tree, thankfully. There's no tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so we can't get, you know, tricked by Satan and mess it all up again. None of that's there. Uh, so when God says, this is your home for all of eternity, I believe it. And we don't have any reason to, to worry about sin messing the picture back up because there's no sin in heaven. Thank you for answering those very easy questions. Hey, thank you for being here to the audience and to those who are streaming online on Periscope. We're so grateful uh, that you're with us tonight, and we hope that, that you've benefited from being here. Uh, we invite you to be back with us tomorrow night at 7 o'clock as we discuss the topic of why are there so many churches? Is there one true church? And if so, how do I find it? We hope you'll join us, and we hope you have a great evening.